Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Cigar Sundays. Today I'm joined by my good friend, IH Motion, real name, Yanis. How are you doing guys? Nice to be here. And today we're gonna to be smoking Romeo Julietta's uh, number ones. And funny story, we actually tried recording this two days ago and we were sat right here and uh, the weather decided to troll us. Um, near the beginning, in the first like 15 minutes, it just started putting it down and we, we had to abandon ship. So it's humbling, isn't it? It's humbling yeah, it and it's raining. It's gonna, if you look, it is gonna we're gonna get Yeah, we, we, we gotta stop. Fuck. Oh my God. <laughs> quick break, guys. Quick, quick, quick break. <laughs> And boys, you may have noticed that we have a brand new slick ass intro animation. So I guess to start off this talk, Yanis, why don't you tell the boys here what you do for a living? I do a lot of creative work, um, mainly in the 3D space at the moment. I also do uh, 2D animations and uh, branding and illustrations. Um, so it, uh, it basically goes throughout the whole spectrum anything that's animated or illustrated, um, I do it. So um, yeah, I talked to my good friend Sam and uh, decided that he needs a cool new intro for his uh, Cigar Sunday series. I really like that podcast, so I hooked him up. You hooked me up, man, big time. How much, how much would you, because I got this for free, guys, that awesome ass animation. Just for the privilege of being friends with Yanis here, I got it for free, but how much would you usually charge for something like that? I'm really curious, actually. I don't know. I actually don't know. Um, it it kind of depends. Um, if the client already has like a very clear vision of what they want to have, then uh, I can basically calculate how long it would take me to exactly recreate what he wants. Um, in this case, I just I did it how I liked it because I kind of know what you like as well, so it was easier for me. If I had to roughly calculate, I would, I would say around four to six k, but uh, wow. that's but that's like that's like the animation, and then you get like uh, social media posts as well. You get the assets from the animation, and it's mostly not just like one animation or yeah. one intro. It's mostly like a package. It's, an asset, yeah. it's a package, yeah. So because I have to create the whole scene, which yeah. is like the main work. You know, you can use it for a lot of different stuff. And it's, it's high, high skill ceiling stuff as well. Like no one can, not anyone can just hop on a PC and make something like that. You know, it's a very high income, high skill ceiling skill to have. So, wow, four to six K and I, I got it for free for just being your friend. <laughs> yeah. That's actually- You owe me, you owe me. <laughs> That's epic. Put my Instagram here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose, I suppose we should start with, how, how did we actually meet Yanis? How did we meet? Yanis has been my best friend for five years, guys. How did we meet? What's the story there? How did two people like us cross paths? Two twin brothers. We get that a lot. People say that we look alike. I feel like I'm like the inbred UK cousin. A bit more rugged looking, you know? I'm a bit more rugged. No, you're, you're the older brother. I'm yeah. the younger one. Yeah. You're more experienced. You're, you like, you're just like a clean dude and I'm just a bit like, woo. We actually met in a video game. You guys might know it. It's called Rust. It's a survival game. You spawn on an island. You gotta build a base. You gotta conquer the, conquer the island. It was like uh, 3 a.m. midnight, all my <laughs> friends were offline. I was sad and lonely. I was uh, chilling on uh, the top of my base, looking for people to shoot. And I see, uh, I see this naked man running around talking bullshit. Yeah, I shot him, <laughs> but a quick chat, and then I ended his life. But so, so, when, so when you get shot on this game, you go down for a bit, and you can like still speak while you're down, so you can talk as much shit as possible, which is the absolute best part of video games, by the way, which is being eradicated from games because people are too soft. I remember H1Z1 lobbies, man. Mm. Oh my God, like a hundred people in a lobby just screaming the most like heinous shit that could come to mind. And that was like the absolute peak of gaming. Modern Warfare 2 lobbies, everyone knows Modern Warfare 2 lobbies. Uh, and games are like, oh. coming more and more soft, more and more soft. You can't talk shit in games anymore. Counter, the Counter-Strike halftime chat. Oh, oh my God, I forgot about that. You used to be able to talk shit between CS games as well. Oh, it's yeah, mid-game, mid, mid you yeah, that first, you yeah, that first half and hearts were broken and then that, that quick break came where you can hear the enemies and the enemies can hear you. Oh my God. Hell broke loose. Just but 15 seconds of pure yeah, pain just... of shit being thrown at each other. Yeah, it's good times, man. But yeah, so you downed me on Rust and then you sort of stood over my body and I was, I, you know, I was infamously chatting shit as always, you know, just talking a load of crap. I mean, from my POV here, I've just been killed by some dickhead on a roof. So I'm a bit pissed and I've lost my one and only pickaxe, my resources. And then uh, about 10 minutes later, I get a comment on my Steam profile from this guy called Ostrix. And he's, uh, he's like, hey man, 
Sorry, I just killed you, XD. It's still on my Steam profile. I'll, I'll put it on yeah. screen. I don't usually edit the podcast, but I'll, I'll put it on screen. Hey, man, just killed you. Sorry, man. Uh, you can come get your stuff if you want. And then we actually became friends from that. Yeah, you invited me to the Discord, and then from there we just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a, it's, it's a uh, lovely story. <laughs> Yanis, you're my only friend. Period. <laughs> <laughs> you're my only friend who is... Uh, still my friend back from the video gaming days. We had a lot of mutual friends. Um, you know, we, we, we were in sort of groups together, like, you know, playing games as you do, being fucking geeks. But our friendship is the only one that's truly lasted, like, you know, the, the test of time. Why is that? That's actually the same question that I ask myself a lot. Like, um, I don't know how we did it, but we somehow switched paths in life at the same time into the same directions and it wasn't even like like one or the other was like pushing the other person to go there it kind of just it kind of just happened i don't know how um i remember i started going gym way before you did when i went gym like um, life on your side was still pretty dark and i was always i was always trying to get sam to go to the gym i was like pretty difficult with all his like mental boundaries that he had but yeah it, it took like uh took i think a, a little heartbreak for you Little, if I'm not little, mistaken. Little heartbreak, my League of Legends girlfriend. Yeah. She started duo queuing with a Draven main. Unacceptable. Getting uh, blacked by really, Draven. That really fucked me up. <laughs> <laughs> Feels bad. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So, no, like, just on that real quick, like, it might seem dumb, like, um, you know, like these online relationships types of thing. But because of the mental place that I was at, it was genuinely like, this is so unhealthy by the way, but it's genuinely like one of the only things sort of gluing me together, you know? I had no other prospects. So like this fucking chick likes me and uh, she tells me she loves me and I, I, I got all of my self-esteem from that, all of it. I was all in on that relationship and it's a horrible place to be in a relationship. You, do, you need abundance in a relationship. As a man, certainly you need, you need a lot of abundance. You need a lot of outlets and you need a lot of options. I had none of that. So when it did crumble, it really fucked me up, even though it is like a silly online relationship. It really fucked me up. So that was that absolutely the, the push I needed. And I think Yanis does not get enough credit for my success either. A lot of you boys, you credit Hamza a lot. And Hamza certainly helped me along the journey, certainly. But Yanis is the one who got me into the gym. And Yanis is actually the one who encouraged me to offer my video editing as a service to sell. Because you were doing it. Mm. So you were, you were a step ahead of me, you know, in, in, a, in a lot of senses. You were a step ahead of me in the gym step ahead of me in terms of um, generating money online. So Yanis is actually the one who convinced me to start selling my shit because back then I was just video editing my own silly gaming videos. And like, I got a lot of joy from doing that and they're still all on my channel. You can watch them all right now. I got a lot of joy from that simply because I enjoyed making my friends laugh. Like I didn't, no one really else saw the videos. Like I weren't pushing them out. Like it was just my friends. So when I put out a video, I'd join a discord group and everyone would be like, oh Sam, you put out a new video, let's all watch it. And we would watch it and I've already watched it 20 million times because I'm a very much so like a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to editing. So I'd, I'd very carefully and make a lot of calculated decisions. I've already watched it, but I'll watch it again. And everyone's laughing and I'd get so much joy from that. And that was like such a light at the end of the tunnel type of thing for me at that point in time because I was so fucking miserable. I was, I had nothing. So editing those silly gaming videos with my friends in them really fucking helped pull me through. And that's the only marketable skill that I ended up having because I did that. So you, Yanis, actually told me, listen, Sam, you're quite good at what you do, actually. I had no self-esteem. I didn't know that I was any good. I didn't know I had any creativity or any like, you know, mindset, any brains. And you need a lot of creativity for video editing. The, the reason the Jeffrey and Adonis format was made is because of the creativity that comes along with, and the decision-making that comes along with video editing. So you told me, you said, Sam, you're quite good at what you do, actually. You should try and sell it. And I was like, literally for three months, I, I remember three months straight, you were trying to convince me, like soft convince. You weren't like hounding me, but you're like, hey, Sam, you should try Fiverr. You should try Fiverr, man. You should try make some money, da, da, da. And I'll be like, no, oh, I'm not good enough, da, da, da. and then eventually, three months later, because I'm a bit of a stubborn fucking guy, as we know, I'm very stubborn, I did it. I made a Fiverr gig, and my first client was Hamza. That's actually mad, that's actually the first one. First client, Hamza. And that, I, think, I think that's the best, 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 best example, especially for people who have a, a certain type of skill set. And I, I literally, like, um, I catch myself thinking the same things, like, oh, I can do this, but 
there's probably people who can do it better. So why, why would I sell it? If they're, Bullshit. If, yeah, it's like if, if, if you think that way and you don't put anything of yourself out, you could be the absolute pinnacle of an artist in any type of spectrum. If you don't put your work out or try to find clients or find work with what you can offer, you won't find anything because like no, no one is going to look for it. Put yourself out there, show people what you can, and there will be people who see it and think, wow, I want to work with this guy. This, this dude does really cool shit. And I think that's really important that you really, that you start putting yourself out there. It's also subjective as fuck, isn't it? Creativity is very subjective. I wasn't the most mechanically talented video editor. I wasn't mechanically talented. I was still using Vegas. You know, I was doing like scuffed ass, you know, subtitles with like the fucking bold effect. Mm. And that. I wasn't mechanically great. But what I did have, which worked wonders for Hamza, was the mindset. I was Jeffrey. I was that guy. I was the most boots on the ground editor you could possibly find. I was exactly what Hamza's audience needed, you know? So my editing and how I represented ideas on the screen reflected that. And that's why it resonated so much along with Hamza's excellent storytelling, not taking anything away from that. He is very good at storytelling. But that combination created an absolute masterpiece of a format. And that's why it just, it propelled. So it's very subjective. You could have, you know, Hamza could have hired a very mechanically talented video editor. Like he knows all of the animations and he's got all the presets and all this shit. But like, it wouldn't have been anywhere near as effective as, as what I did. Nowhere near, you know. Oh, he has a clean, you know. It's something I hound on about to my students learning video editing inside of my academy is that they need to develop their own format. A lot of them are just trying to emulate styles. Oh, I want to do the Eman Gadzi style. It's like it goes against the entire point of being an irreplaceable asset to a team because if you're just emulating someone else's style, you're not the only one doing that, bro. You have to develop your own style. And that's, that's the beauty in creative work. It's subjective. You need to have the decision-making and the, the, the intelligence, the emotional intelligence. I really think emotional intelligence is so underrated for creativity. You need to have emotional intelligence and that is when you start making the big bucks. How would you explain emotional intelligence? It's really hard because it's not really measurable. It's not really a measurable thing. You can measure IQ, but you can't really measure emotional intelligence. You can argue how, you know, accurate IQ is as well. Like, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a metric to success. It could be, but not all the time. You know, again, everything's so subjective. To think that you don't have anything valuable to offer to the world, if you try your very best at whatever you do, is absolutely ridiculous. But in terms of developing emotional intelligence, it's really difficult. But what I do think is that people who have been through some shit naturally develop a level of emotional intelligence. I think the mental gymnastics that I've had to sort of endure and go through in relationships in my life has really helped me develop a, a mega rational mindset, um, specifically with my mom. I think trying to deal with my mom has led to me having a very rational, logical mindset, less emotional. Um, and you can argue if that's a good or bad thing. I think it serves me very well in some cases and it, it doesn't serve me well in other cases. For example, like, you know, with girls, girls are very emotional and I'm just like, uh, just a rock sometimes. I'm just, you know, <laughs> it's quite hard to get through to me sometimes, but it's certainly, again, it's all so subjective. If you're a more emotionally driven person, I could imagine that you can make some fucking incredible stuff. I would even put a bit broader. I just think you have to have a lot of experiences to be able to live out creativity. Mm. Because like the, the simple, the most simple example, if you never got your heart broken and you sh should do anything creative of let's say a heartbreak song, let's say you should do a music video. <laughs> How, how should you be able to like catch that feeling or like show the feeling in the video of your heart being broken if you've never felt it before? And that basically counts for everything. So I think, especially as a creative working person, the more experiences you can get in any field, e even if it's nothing that's like directly connected to being creative, helps you in your work. Like for example, I, I remember I did like, um, I had to do apprenticeships and stuff in school. And I went to like, I was, I was, a, I was um, on a construction site 
for like two weeks. Horrible. <laughs> like, no, like for real, yeah, like, it seemed like six, the construction site. Bro, listen, site si 6 a.m. in the morning, yeah. it's a house that's just, it's just a structure, it's just concrete. No windows in there, no doors, nothing. It was winter. It was like minus degrees. 6 a.m., you stand there and you just freeze into death. And then you're like, yeah, we have these 25 doors and they need to go from there to the fourth floor and then you gotta carry that shit. Yeah. And it, it seemed like the biggest waste of time ever. But now, whenever I get like a, a, a job or something that has something to do with construction or, or properties or something, I know how stuff is built. I know how stuff works. I know where the problems are. I know how the people work who do that stuff. I know what they are looking for. And it, that already helped me. So I think what you mean like with emotional intelligence, I think I would just put the whole spectrum on it. Just experiences in general, experience stuff, keep that knowledge. And whenever you need to use it somewhere, you've got that in your pocket. You know how stuff works. You know what these people are looking for in certain things. And I think that just helps you a lot when you do creative work. Yeah, I mean, I look at, look at, I mean, you're here now in Thailand and you've made a connection already the person who actually owns your where you're staying you know you've actually developed a connection there so like can you tell us about that like yeah um basically the uh, the host of the Airbnb that I'm staying at I had like a chat with him he's a really cool guy and he basically owns a lot of property here and he told me that he does not have anyone um managing like his uh, creative stuff or his IT stuff and um well he knew that I did a uh, video and animations and graphic design and all that so um yeah, we basically had a chat. I tried to hear out what he's missing in his business. Now we're um, talking about how I can help him out. So it's it's um, people everywhere are looking for services there. Maybe not openly asking you to do something, but if you talk to them, you'll find out where they're like where they're missing stuff or where the missing parts are. And if you have a service um, or a skill that can help them out, you may maybe got a new client. You never know. And that's that's such an important. Thing, isn't it to just listen what what you're looking for as someone who's offering services is to fill a problem and as so many people they don't listen <laughs> they talk a lot there's a lot of people who like talking but if you actually just sit back and listen and you you listen for the problem the pain point that's all that's all we're trying to do you know solve pain points you have a you have a problem I have a solution so by you being intelligent enough to actually you know strike up a conversation with this guy who's clearly doing very, very well for himself and to listen for his pain points and offer a solution you now have a new client and you also have a fucking good ass friend to have here mm. this motherfucker owns a lot of villas here a lot of properties seems like a very good contact yeah so yeah so the, the initial question I wanted to ask was what's it like being my friend I think a lot of people watching this they see me on the camera and I've, I've heard a lot actually like when I've met people who have been watching me online for a while but haven't quite met me yet and they meet me they say wow Sam you really are about it you are that guy you know on camera I don't necessarily come across as that guy and maybe I come across as a guy who's trying a bit too hard maybe I don't know but I guess people are probably curious what am I like in real life like what is it like being my friend um well I think the people being honest yeah, no, no, no. Um, I have to say, b because I've known you for so long, you did do a very hard turn on, at, 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 at a certain point. Um, so f for me, it was all, also like um, when I was watching your videos, because I, I knew how, like how you are in real life. Mm. Um, first off, I thought it was um, you were more presenting your values instead of like actually showing your personality. But I, I also have to say, we had like phases in the last one or two years where we did not have that much contact, especially because he moved to Thailand, he had his own adventures and stuff. I had, my, had a lot to do at home, so uh, we didn't talk that much. And in that time when I was watching the videos, I was like, okay, he's more presenting like the values that he's supporting instead of like showing himself. When, um, when we started hanging out again, I realized, okay, he actually did have a change in his personality. Like you, you did change, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and you actually did become that person that you're basically shown on the internet. I think at first it is faking it until you make it, kind of, right? It, it, it might have, but like for me it was like how I said, when I watched it, I thought you were doing it. And when I met you, I realized, no, you actually live that now. So I, 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 don't, I don't know how you started. For me, it's just like I watched it and then afterwards, you know, I, I experienced you what again. The, what are the major changes you've, you've noticed? Because oh, you've known me since I was a yeah, that's what I mean. It's everything. 
bro. Like you're, you're a completely new person. Sure. I don't I don't know what to say. It's like I could start, but it's, it will be an endless list. I mean, you can like if you put it very simple, dude, geeky as fuck, sitting only at home, can't even get on the bus to go get groceries. Like literally, like, I literally. Tell them about when you came to my house. Okay, so. Oh my God. So um, you, you guys can put in the comments what you think of this. <laughs> you have an online buddy and like you don't really, you couldn't, you couldn't, um, if, if, if somebody talked to you online, that person could not tell that you had bad anxiety, yeah. in, in my opinion. You, you seem like a completely normal, funny person to be around, you know what I mean? Like just a normal dude. And my idea was, I'm gonna go to England. Like we, ha we hadn't met to this point ever in real life. We just been talking over Discord. So my idea was, I wanted to go to England anyway to visit some of my other friends there, and uh, because I knew he wasn't like the most like ease person to come out of his house, but I felt like I'm gonna go there. We're gonna meet, have a nice chat, maybe go to cinema, and then that's it. So I basically, I went to his house as a surprise. Didn't tell me. I did not tell him, but I did, he didn't even. Did, did you know that I was coming to England in no. general? No. Okay, so basically, like, he didn't know anything, and I got my other friends from the UK to drive to his house. He also knew them, by the way, um, from Discord. And yeah, we were just standing in front of his house, and I think I texted, yeah, I, I, I sent him an image of, of his house from the other, I was like, come out or something. And yeah. uh, I, he read it, and he didn't respond for like 10 minutes or something. I was like, what the fuck's going on? And then, uh, yeah, he kind of he kind of had a panic attack, apparently. It was kind of a difficult situation. Yeah, so... Maybe you describe it from your point of view. I would say, chaps, if you're dealing with someone who has uh, crippling social anxiety, I would not suggest showing up to their house as a surprise, which Yanis did. And it was a nice gesture, but it was very incalculated because it ended up being quite sad, actually, because he showed up, my friends are outside of my house, and I don't have the mental capacity to walk outside and to go out with them. I, I have to say, though, um, I, I knew that you had anxiety, but I don't think I you knew never, how bad it was. I, n I never had one moment talking to you where I thought, "Damn, you're done bad." Do you know what I mean? Like, I never had a problem where you broke down on a call. Or you're like, oh, like I've never experienced you in like a, a bad state of mind I never online. Never about it, to be honest. Yeah, that's and th that's what I thought. Of course, you, you maybe you don't want to go on a bus. There's mad people, a lot of stress. For me, it was like, you know me, you know me well. You know that I won't put you into any situations that you don't like. So for me, it was like, we're gonna show, that, that, that's why I literally didn't plan anything big. I just showed up, I thought we can say hello, and then I asked you if you want to go cinema. So it's like a low risk environment, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in, in my head, it was, it was like easy for him to do that than go on the bus. So that's why I thought, oh, he's gonna be happy to see me, but I, I just didn't know that it was that bad. Yeah, so what ended up happening is after about 10 minutes, I stepped outside and I, I sort of said hi to everyone. Um, and it was just a bit, it was just quite sad really, because I, I, they, they wanted me to come out, they wanted to like, you know, spend time with me, and I, I genuinely did not have the mental capacity the mental um, ability to to go outside and spend time with my friends, even in like a cinema, you know. So um, it ended up being very sad. I, I saw him very briefly for like 10 minutes and then they, they went away again. I said, I, I can't do it, I can't. So we didn't actually, um, we didn't actually end up meeting again until like a year later. And at that point I had made some some strides and I was able to leave the house <laughs> and go to the fucking cinema. Um, Did you go to the gym at that point already? Okay, uh, because for me it's very uh, it's very hard to put shit into like a time perspective. I don't think so. But like just just that story that we just told, compare that to where he is now. And yeah. it's like it's not it's not fake. It's like three it, years it's like ago. he he really become that person. So um, if, if he tells you, stop playing video games, go to the gym, do your shit, and it'll change your life, there you have it. There you literally, a bro that couldn't, that he, he could not come out of his house for five minutes to say hello and to his was, online friend so, that he already knew. It was so low, low bar as well. Like, come outside, you, we've got a car, you, me and my friends, we we'll just go to the cinema. And, I, I, I and even, the cinema is just like it's just you watching a film. And, I couldn't even. Do and it. and I even I remember I said let's let's take a movie later. So we my my plan was I like, go to your house, we say hello, 
you can ease with me for a few minutes and then I'll let, leave you at your house for like one or two hours so you can like mentally prepare and then we go watch the movie. Yeah. And I remember when we were driving off, you were like, oh bro, I'm not coming. But yeah, that, that, that's like, um, that's the mad gap from back then to now. Your question was how it is to be a friend. It's great. <laughs> no, that, that, that's what I said earlier because back in the day, I, maybe I wasn't, I definitely wasn't as down bad as he was. But I still wasn't in the right place. We were both just sitting at home all day, Jeez. watching memes, playing video games, Sis doing guy. jack shit. I think you said that uh, before as well. We always both had this drive to at least create something. We were never these passive, just playing games, going offline and then sleeping or whatever. We were always like, we're playing games. Oh, we had a nice clip. Let's make an edit. Let's make a YouTube video. Let's do a video together. Like we, we had no, we didn't make any money with this. No one knew us. It wasn't just, we just wanted to create stuff. We actually made a funny Ross channel, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah. And those that you can still find those ones. So he, he ran a Ross channel, which is a game we met on and uh, actually got quite popular, really. You were more of the brains of the operation and I was a bit more of like the front man personality. We made like these dumbass uh, song parodies. Yeah, these were great. <laughs> oh my God. We had that one Drake one, like, which, <laughs> what, what was it? Uh, building plan. Building plan. Building yeah. plan. God's plan, building plan. Go, go, look up Rust building plan and, <laughs> and listen to his fucking beautiful voice. Yeah, so there's, there's actually such a backlog of like very highly autistic content of me on the internet. Even on my own channel and on, on your channel, which is, which is Austrix official, right? I think it's just Austrix. Okay. It might, it might, the, the handle might be Austrix official, but if you put in Austrix Rust, you'll find it. it's like a little. But we actually got popular on Rust. Yeah, we, we actually became kind of like cult like figures on Rust, even yeah. though the channel like 15,000 subs. I think the problem with Rust YouTube scene was everyone was super boring and robotic, and we came in once again, sort of these young bucks. Again, subjective creative work. Everyone was being very robotic and like. Mm, 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 mm. We came in, we just, you know, took the piss of it. You know, we sort of injected our personalities into the videos, and it really resonated with a lot of people. I, because I remember I was watching. Um, I loved Rust, but, but like back in the day, Rust was really good. It was a really great game game to play. Now, not uh, so much uh, anymore. I'd say I haven't played it for a good while. No. Now, I would say in, in, the, in the beginning, uh, it, was, it, it was bare fun. <laughs> no, no, I, I can say it was bare fun, okay. and then at some point it had a turning thing, and then it went to You cancer. know what ruins games? What ruins games is when people take them too serious, and they get, like, competitive. Yeah, yeah. now it's like server wipes, fucking yeah. 18 people Sweaty in a clan clans, just built, like, yeah. that giant base, and then they have everything at the end of day one, and then they just fuck with people. It's, I don't know. But back in the day, it was cool. So you're, you're in Thailand now. Yes. What do you think, man? What do you think? What do you think of where I've been sort of based in the last um, nine months or so, along with Dubai? I haven't been to Dubai yet, but yeah, because um, you're you're a bit of a city boy. A generally. city boy. Generally speaking, city you, like, you like your cities. I love big cities. Love mm. big cities. London is a fail society. I still love it. Not in terms of like living there, but uh, I'm just um, I'm a sucker for architecture, modern stuff, stuff that's like high class, bougie kind, I, I just, I don't know, I'm, I just love that shit. So London is like a gold mine. You can just walk around for 20 minutes in X direction and you'll see office spaces with palm trees in the entrance and then golden thing, this, leather wall, that, you know, it's just, just everything looks sick. Yeah, I, I, I get love... pissed off walking around with him and he's like, look at that building, whoa, and then he takes like, 20 cinematic shots in the film. <laughs> I'm like, man, can we just fucking go? I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I, that, that's just something I love. Basically, when, when he told me come to Thailand in the first place, I was very skeptical. I didn't even know if I would really wanted to do it, but when he said that he's moving here, it was like a different thing because I was like, okay, I, I have to come here anyway to see my brother. I did not have any expectations in Thailand. I didn't look anything up before I came. I didn't watch any videos. I haven't seen any photos. I, ha I did not see a single thing of Bangkok before I went there. Not one image. I had no clue what to expect in general. Um, I just had what he told me. What, what he experienced here, how he found it, how the people are. Um, and yeah, how I already said, everything that he told me about Thailand is true. It's just true. I like that. There's nothing where I was like, oh, you said this, but I don't, I don't see it that way. I, like all the shit that you told me about Thailand is very accurate. I think everyone should come here at least once and just experience the vibe. Even if it's- See if you like it. Yeah, see if you like it. I, I can say Bangkok is more of a, of course, big city vibe. So you got, mm, I would say more modern buildings, giant malls. It's very modern, but you have parts next to it where you have just tons of traditional restaurants and these little shops. So it's like, I think it's a good mixture. I would say, I don't know how you would 
It's very Scott culturally Bangkok. rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's very culturally yeah. rich, which is what I think in general like, I love Dubai, but Dubai lacks that, which is why I, I choose to sort of base here for the most part, and then I'm in between here and Dubai. Um, I think Dubai is fantastic for networking, though. I can imagine. Absolutely. I can imagine. Incredible, but you, you'll spend a lot of money, so <laughs> just be careful. Mm. <laughs> just be careful, you know. Oh, you want to go out for cigars? Oh, you want to do jet skis? Oh, you want to go for steak? Like, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Get spenny. Get spenny quick, but... Uh, Samui, you can definitely tell that it's more of a touristy island. A lot of people come here, stay for a few days, go to the next island. Island hopping, it's called, right? Yeah. So, it's... It's, you have more of a holiday vibe here. You've got nice beaches, cool restaurants. It's a bit, not, not less modern, how would you say it? It's, it's a bit more simple, but you still, for example, find great malls. Like Central Samui has a great mall, a lot of restaurants, looks very modern, right? You've got most of what you need, really. Yeah, everything you need is basically on here. Of course, it's way more simple than Bangkok, obviously. Um, but you get way more nature. you got mad views. Beautiful. How I said, the beaches are great. Beautiful. You still get very nice workspaces, like view, viewpoints. Viewpoints. Yeah, you get like mad viewpoints. Uh, I guess if you don't like busy, like busy cities, Bangkok is really busy. Crazy. Don't even try to get anywhere with a car or a taxi. Just forget about it. Get either get a scooter taxi or get a scooter yourself or just walk. Most or of the times you, you want you want a, lo a good location. Like you want your home to be in a good location in Bangkok. Yeah, but but still, if if you have to go anywhere, you're you're fucked. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like even even if you live in the in the best area, if you want to go anywhere else in Bangkok, you'll you, it'll take some time. So that's the only downside. And here it's like you get on a scooter, you drive anywhere. Yeah. The, it's traffic is fine. You can get anywhere in like 15, 20 minutes. It's it's yeah. it's easy. It's very easy to get anywhere here. So yeah, this is I would say more touristy, more like a holiday thing. But you can still easily live here. Like workspaces, you can get shit done. You can zone in, and you can fly to Bangkok if you want. How long is the flight? Like 30, 40 minutes. Forty minutes. Even if you love Bangkok but you don't want to live there, move here, and then whenever you can just t take a few days and fly to Bangkok. Yeah, easy. Yeah. yeah. But until now, like talent a lot. Had did not have any expectations, but it, like everything that I did imagine before I come here, it's it's ten times better than I thought. What do you think of the women? here in Thailand, Janis, compared to, obviously, you know, you've been living in Germany your whole life. What's the difference? Is there a difference? Um, I, will, I will talk about the actual Thai women and not the uh, women that come here to visit. The because, island hopping homes. Yeah, the, <laughs> the island hopping women, because uh, these are the same ones you'll find anywhere in the Western world because they come here. I'll talk about the Thai women. What I've noticed here, it's like, it's hard to explain. In the Western world, Women don't really show you, um, I'm not sure if affection is the right word, if you don't know a woman and you meet her, they are m most of the time very protective, they tr play a bit hard to get, they make it hard for you to, you know, until you can tell if they like you or not, it's like a bit, you have to play a little bit of a game to get, you know, behind that first wall. And here in Thailand, that first wall is just not there. It's like they, you get way more looks, you can tell if, if they're interested, they smile at you, it's, it, it just seems like they're more open if they're interested in you, I guess. I don't know how you would describe it. Everyone that I ask this question says the exact same thing. Yeah, and that it's, it's not like a, like a, if you come here and you go anywhere in a bar area, that's the first thing you experience. It's not, not like hard to, you just walk through a bar area with a lot of women and you, you can instantly tell they're interested. Like they smile at you, they look at you, they even cat call you sometimes. Like where do you, have you ever had that experience in the Western world anywhere? I, I did not. So for me, it was very like, damn, okay, this is different. This is very different. Um, and I, f I find this, it, it's like a very harsh comparison if, if you just take a look at what you have to do to pull in the Western world and what you get for it. And then you compare it to here, where it's like way easier. As far as I can tell, the women are way more feminine, way nicer, way nicer to talk to. And it, it, it's still, it's, it's way easier. So um, the first thing I thought is like, why do I go through all this bullshit with girls in the Western world? I have to play all these games, all these shit tests. That's the, that's the exact like thing, the game. Like yeah. the Western women, they have this like, uh, they, 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 it's you like, have it's to like juggle they, for they, them. They, I think like they, they feel like they are ashamed if they openly show that they're interested or something like that. There's like a boundary, mm -hmm. but you know what I mean? I mean, uh, to, to some extent, I like the game, but it's, it's kind of what you say, like in terms of how you have to play the game to, with Western women, 
versus what you end up getting usually. You have to pay more and you get less. Yeah. Like m m more troubles. I don't like um, drama. Yeah, it's it's, it's it, they like how you said they're just m way more feminine. Way more feminine. They, yeah. they they fit into their role way better. Um, and how you just said, of course, like if you have a little game, it's interesting. Mm. It's like spicy. You don't have to like kind of fight your way to to get the woman. It's just. In the West, in the it's, it's Western world, I can. That's probably the yep. right term, right? In the Western world, I don't know. Um, I think it's a bit, it's a bit too much. It's like it, it always feels like you're, you're trying to do something bad to them when you're like trying to hit them up or something. You feel like they're, they're, tr they're like, like they don't even want, they don't even want, want to chat with you, but you know they're interested. So it's like it's, it's a dumb game. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's like, it's like the feminists are kind of ruining it for all of the women. They're saying like, you know. If you go up and talk to me in the gym, just leave me alone. I'm trying to work out. If you're trying to walk, talk to me while I'm shopping, just leave me alone. I'm trying to shop. And it's like, man, when do, I, when do I speak to women then? I think it's like they expect you to only speak to women when you're drunk in a bar. And that's when you have like the most worst shallow interactions with the worst type of women who are like constantly there and they've got like a 20 plus body count. It's like, if I can't even like speak to women, if you're making, if you're trying to condition me into believing that speaking to women in the street, in the gym, in the shop is like a weird thing, then when do I speak to women? And I, like, I only speak to women when it's in a shitty environment and we're both like hopped up on substances and we wake up the next morning. We've just shared the most intimate parts of our, our souls with each other and we don't even fucking know each other's names. Like that's the sort of Western conditioning that's being put onto men on social media. Like don't talk to me, I'm in the gym, I'm working out. Yeah, I'm, I'm like this independent, you know, you can't pull me, don't even think you can flirt with me now, you know, I'm doing my, it's like, but, but of, of course there's horrible, horrible dudes. I know there's like, of course. The, like these, but like that's the these, style this, though, because there's always there's always yeah, there's like a, some truth yeah. to it, but it gets inflated. No, it's, I don't even think there's truth in it. It's like in every department in life, there's assholes. In jobs, in in schools, or what you will always find someone who's an asshole. But to just put put this like, just in general, say I don't want to be talked at if I do X. If I just come there, I'm like, hey, sorry to interrupt you. Just want to say, I think you're really attractive. Can I maybe have your Instagram? How is that ruining your day? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But, but that, that's, that should but be that's like the a... start, though, because most women are actually open to that. But there's a massive level of resistance in men doing that now because of the pressure that they feel from these psyoped individuals. And like the people who are pushing this are like fours. They're dogs. Like men don't even want to speak to them anyway. You know what I mean? They just, they just ruining it for the rest of the women. I mean, there's also a lot of attractive women who play that game now. Because especially these ones that are already so lost. Do you know what I mean? Like, body counts in the, you know what I mean? In the good yeah, digits. I, I get, yeah, okay. So like and maybe then they, they just can, think like they're shit. Maybe they're physically attractive, but like spiritually they are completely devoid. Of which, course. Which is yeah, of, of course, of course. I mean, again, the type of women, you can speak to them in the bar when you're both drunk and you don't even know each other's names. And they're like, oh yeah, that's so, oh, hot girl summer. Yeah, you know. Trash. No, but like to, to come back uh, to Thai women, just just great people to be around, to put it in general. It's it's fun. You have fun interactions. It doesn't seem like they're trying to test you all the time. It's like you can tell because she's interested or not. You have a great evening, whatever happens. But um, there's not there's the, the boundary to the end. Like do you know like the 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 barrier to entry. The barrier to entry is like way lower if it's even there. But like most most Thai women, they just look at you and smile, and you already know you could just go over there, and you know you could, you could have a great chat, have a great time, and buy around or whatever, do some, have some drinks. I don't just like whatever you want to do. If you're interested, talk to them. You want to have a nice chat, and they're not going to try play like oh, I don't want to talk to you. I think it's just that the air here in Thailand is so different. Like I recently went back to the UK for like two months, and I felt my soul just being sucked out of my body within you know, a week of being back. Every time I go back to the UK, I always tell myself, no, Sam, you're gonna carry this good energy you've got, this open energy with me back to the UK. And every time it lasts three days until I'm back to, you know, head down, keep to yourself, bro, NPC path, A to B. You know, I'm going to the gym, don't say hi to anyone. Just keep to yourself, bro, you know what I mean? It's like here in Thailand, it's so much easier to open up your inner dialogue to the world and if you're a good person with a good heart, you have nothing bad to say. For example, if I'm in the UK and I'm walking down the street and I see someone walking a cute dog, I, I'll think it in my brain, but I won't say it out loud. I don't know why, I just won't say, oh, that's a cute dog. You know, I'll think it, I won't say it. Here, I see a cute dog. I'm like, 
that's a cute dog. What's his name? You know, open dialogue, open dialogue. And that's, that's like celebrated here. And it makes for a much happier environment and populace. But in the UK, it's like, I don't know, it's just fucking stomped out of you. I don't know what it is. I, I come from Germany for the people who don't know. And um, I tried to in uh, introduce like my German friends to him. And whenever I told him, oh, yo, my best mate is coming, he's from England. Um, and we can just go out together. The first thing I said is like, oh, I don't know. Oh, my English is not good. Oh, I'm going to embarrass myself. Oh, I don't know if I want to talk to him and all this. It's like, he's my best friend and he's coming to visit and people don't want to talk to him because they don't speak English properly. There's Thai people here. You can tell they don't understand one word that you say to them. But if they pass you, they look at you, they say hello. That they are not scared to engage with, with you, even though they don't speak any English, and you can just tell they're their English still... is fine here. Yeah, yeah no, but, I'm, 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 but there's like people. But it's who not don't... great English. No, no, no. Like your German friends, they actually have fine English. They just don't want to fucking speak. I know, I know, but that's what I mean. It's like even even the people here don't speak your language. You can just tell by their body language and how they look at you that they are open to talk to, you, even though they probably have no clue what the fuck's going on. Yeah. So the, the people are just so open. Like they, they basically invite you with their body language to talk to them. There's like no, no, again, no barrier. I don't know where that's from. I just think it's like the Thai spirit, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's like one of the first things I know is everyone, it's, it's so easy to engage with people. You, you don't have, I don't know, they, they don't look like they're fucking dying inside. Yeah, head down. Yeah, head NPC down. NPC path, like, okay. They, are, they hate their job and all this stuff. They, they here probably get paid a fraction from what you would get they, in the UK they, and they, they have, still. They have like, they have nothing here compared to what people have in Western society. Like, you know, they live in like a fucking hut. Yeah. And yeah. even they want to talk to you, they give you a good service, they do whatever you ask, they, they don't pull any faces, whatever you ask from them, they're just proper nice people. Yeah. You want to talk to them. And, and, and you want to treat them well as well. Yeah, yeah, you, you, they, they, it's, why it's, not? It's a self-fulfilling cycle of like everyone happy here. Yeah. Everyone's happy, everyone chooses to be happy. But again, like when I'm back in the UK, like I, I got it for like three days until it's just back to like, oh, fuck me. Like it's just such a negative feedback loop to be involved in, just walk like just walking around say, like saying hi to someone and they're just like they're just shell shocked as if it's like a crazy thing like oh my god he's saying hi to me what do you mean leave me alone you know what I mean what does he want <laughs> it's fucking crazy. yeah it's, it's mad I don't know like in the Western world it just feels like everyone wants to everyone wants to be alone but when they are alone they're they're sad that they're alone it's like hard to explain you know what i mean it's like i think most of the people in the western world are more lonely than they are like you know engaged with people mm -hmm. but if they walk on the street they still had how you said headphones on uh head down and then like a long ass face so it's I like i think it's also like they get their they get their like they they paint their picture of the world through social media like i opened twitter for the first time or x for the first time like a few days ago and i saw just like awful shit happening like oh yeah this, uh, this horrible thing happened here this horrible thing happened here and it's like man the, the world sucks so like imagine if the only time you paint a portrait of the world is just through that lens the lens of social media or the news which i think the news is a big one as well people just fucking npc go to work npc go home npc turn a tv on npc watch the news like the news is like a service to them. Like when, when's anything ever free? Why is the news free? Why is it free? It's, 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 it's not for you. It's not to inform you. It's to push ideas onto you and to paint a negative portrait of the world to keep you miserable. Nothing's fucking free. They make the most profit the more horrible the shit is they can tell you. Yeah. If, if the world is ending, the news will make the most money they've ever made. Yeah, and they make the most money from people who have no spirit, have no soul, and are fucking miserable, don't talk to each other, all hate each other, all divided. That's, that's, that's their profit, that's their machine. The more suffering, the better. Yeah. So oh, like, why, why oh, the oil prices are going up again. Get your gas now. Everybody jumps in the car and goes to the petrol station. Prices go up, people, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like they, the, the, the more shit stuff that happens, if everything is fine, no one is in any urgency to do anything. Yeah. So of course the only thing they want to throw at you is shit. Oh, they're gonna put like some nice stuff in there so it's not as obvious, but most of the show in the news is just horrible. And exaggerated and just sometimes even completely wrong. That's why like people say, oh, I watch a TV for news. Bro, I can't take you seriously. Yeah, and, and like if, if, if it's that fucking serious, I'm gonna hear about it anyway. If it's directly affecting me, I'm gonna hear it or feel it. So what's the point? 
What just, is the point? Like, if you really want to know what's going on, get a proper news source subscription for anything. There's, there's some good news, like, sources out there. You can do your own research. But please do not turn on your fucking TV. It's garbage. And I think that's also a big reason why people are happy here, because their, their painting of the world is painted by them, by leaving their fucking house. By leaving their house and actually going outside and seeing, oh yeah, it's not so fucking bad. If I talk to that person, they're actually not gonna be mean bastards. They're actually just gonna be nice. And that's, what, that's like the self-fulfilling cycle of, of, of Thailand. Whereas in the West, it's just like, you know, our oh, TV, everything's terrible, everything's terrible, everything's terrible. So then you just, you're just a shell. You're just a sh an empty, hollow shell. They just milk you. And yeah, and then you're, you're ready for the condition. You've already been conditioned. Now it's time to milk, 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 you know? And it's like, oh yeah, the, the, new, the, the fucking, in the news today, they're fucking, oh, because of the cough cough, <laughs> we're gonna get 500 pounds given to us. You know, oh, amazing. Yeah. So it was worth it after all. And then your gas prices go up. So the 500 pounds is gone and your prices have gone up and I've just moved that line of complete power over you an inch closer and I'll continue to do that until you're living in a fucking pod. It's like, it's like this example of um, cooking a frog. If you throw a frog in boiling water, it just jumps straight out again. But if you heat it up very slowly, it doesn't even notice that it's getting cooked and at some point it's too late and it's dead. Yeah. And it's like exactly what they're doing. They're just like adding, oh yeah, the, the gas prices go up, but your income doesn't. This goes up, this goes up. I income stays the same. Oh, it's a strike. Oh, third strike. Oh, didn't do anything. Oh, well, what are they gonna do, all quit? No, they need the money so they can b b keep like paying all this stuff. And this, this is what I say as well. Like if you are a part of the middle or lower class and you're in a you know conventional job, you will forever, forever, be crushed under a wave of financial pressure. You will always be lacking. You'll always be clawing for more. And another reason for that is also lifestyle inflation. Like people earn more money, so they spend more money immediately. And that's why anyone that you see in the street is broke. Whether they're making 20 pounds an hour or 10 pounds an hour or 50 pounds an hour, they're all as broke as each other at the end of the month. Maybe the guy with 20 pounds an hour has a slightly nicer apartment and a nicer car, but who gives a fuck? What we actually value as humans, especially men, is freedom. Freedom. And I think that's why everyone's happy here, because while they don't have loads of shit, material shit, they're free. Their minds are free. They can make decisions based on their own jurisdiction. And that's a happy lifestyle. You don't need material shit to feel good. And that's why Thailand's such a fucking incredible place because that is the consensus. And in, in the Western world, that is not the consensus. It's not. I, like, I noticed that here as well because I'm, uh, I, I fell into a trap before as well. I'm not gonna lie, especially the first like year when I was making like some good money off like my, um, my uh, services start or whatever. Start making bands, man. It's so easy to start spending money. Yeah, and that's literally what I did because uh, I, I paid for everything that was like um, important, like my rent and all that stuff. And then I still had like a lot of money like left over. And it's just like, yo, you're just young. And then you just, I know you just think, oh, I can buy this, I can buy that. I yeah, can buy and, this, and, I can buy that. And my friends will really approve of me if I buy this. I'll look so cool to the boys, you know. For, for me, I don't know. It's like, it's hard to explain if there's like a bend in my mind, but I actually, I have like, I like designer stuff. Not just for flex and just like in general, I'm like, I, I like fashion. So yeah. I'm like really into this whole game. But the problem is like, you just, you just fall into this hole where it's like, you work for a year and you make good money, but you always spend on, like you spend the money on dumb shit. And then after you, you're like, I don't even have that many savings, but I'm, I make good money. So what, what the, f where's all this money going? So how you said here, it's like, as soon as I got here, I realized n nobody gives a, f like gives a fuck how you look or what you, what you, what you're wearing or whatever. So like, you, you can, you can drive on your scooter in boxes and you'll just look like the next motherfucker. You know what I mean? P people don't give a, you, you, you start losing your interest in that when you're here as well, because you, I don't know, it's just, n it's, it's nothing on your mind. But if, if I walk around in, in Germany, for example, I see this dude wearing this, that and this here, and then you feel like, oh, I could wear my shit as well. It, it's hard to explain, but. Well, it's stat, it's stat signal, isn't it really? Yeah, k kind of, like in, in my mind, I always think it's like, of course, it is flexing if you break it down, but for me, it's a bit like I kind of want to, I kind of want to show that I'm doing bits, if I'm really honest. Statistic, man. 
Yeah, but it's like it it does the exact opposite because you show that you you show that you make bits of buying shit, and then after a year you realize I didn't even have real savings. So in yeah. other words, you're not you're not doing Lifestyle bits. Lifestyle inflation. You're so not. You're, you're as broke as everyone else, but yeah. you have a nice fucking a t-shirt. Yeah, e exactly, exactly. But Who gives a fuck? Men need freedom. What truly makes us happy is freedom. So it's fucking very easy to fall into lifestyle inflation and a trap that is lifestyle inflation. So that's another reason why everyone, you know, middle class, lower class, they're all as broke as each other, you know. Even if they're making five pounds an hour to 15 pounds, 20 pounds an hour, all as broke as each other at the end of the month because everyone's just falling victim to lifestyle inflation. If you just sit down, work very hard, sacrifice for a few years and set yourself up for future success, that's how you break free. Yeah. But people aren't capable of doing that because their lives are so miserable outside of indulging in that materialism and also just spending money in the bars, picking up chicks, I'll buy her a drink, oh yeah, we'll go to this event, we'll do this, this, this. Because you're so fucking, your soul is so destroyed from the machine that you're a part of that you have to indulge in those sorts of things to even feel adequate. And again, here strips that away entirely because you just see. I earn what he makes in a year in f one day, three days, and he's more happy than me. What the fuck? It's like a mind fuck. It's like, how? And then you start to disconnect those strings in your mind and you realize what life's really about. I heard that's a good way of putting it. That's a good way of putting it. Do you think Thailand is the pinnacle of this type of living? Or do you think you have to see more places do you want to see more places to maybe find something that is even more suitable for you or do you think you're just happy here so you're just gonna stay i am very much so uh i don't like traveling i don't like traveling um which might blow the minds of some people because they fucking love traveling they love hopping place to place to place but i figured out very early that i am most happy when i I'm just dialed in, focused. I can't find any sort of efficiency while I'm jumping from place to place. If you go to a new place, there's at least a two week period of time where you're, where you're adjusting. You're adjusting, you know, there's new currency, new apartment, oh, I've got this problem in the apartment, I've got to get this transport, I've got to find a new places, where's the best cafes to work, where's the best restaurants, what do I do for food? All of this fucky shit, first two weeks, is eating up your mental clarity. There's no way you can focus purely on your mission if you're constantly jumping from place to place. And the only time that you're competitive is when you're taking a shit on the toilet and you're thinking about your business and your mission, whatever your mission is at that time. That's the only time you're competitive. If you're not thinking about your mission while you're having a shit on the toilet, then you will be, you'll be fucking crushed by the competition. You won't be able to compete. You won't. I wouldn't. I would say it's not necessary. Like I've, you, you're, you're talking about. Okay, you would go to let's say Japan, whatever, and you would actually settle down for a month or some shit. But I'm, I'm just talking about. Don't you think it's worth the investment if you would say, okay, I'm gonna go, five, ta five days to Tokyo or something, and then oh, that's not really my place. And then you, you spend here a few months and then you go. How can you figure out if you like a place for doing work in five days? I don't think I need that long. What, 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 what's, what's more, like, I, I, I could have told you that I like Thailand, like, three days in. Because for me, I can, I can, I can tell the vibe. I, I don't need to live here to know how it is living here, if you know what I mean. I, I can imagine. I, I need to see the place, the people, the vibe. I don't think so. And if that's good, then it's only logistics. Okay, how much is, like, the cost of living here? Yeah, but that, that house shit matters Texas. So big time. That, yeah, that it is, but, like, to, to, to get... To get to the logistics, you first need to like the place. If you go to Tokyo for I know, I know, five I know, days I, and you're I know like, I can like a place. Like if I went on holiday to, to yeah, Tokyo, I could say like, yeah, I like Japan. But like that doesn't mean it's a suitable place for me to base. Th that is true, but don't you think that's like the first step of finding out if it's even like a possibility? Sure, but like if I'm already happy here and functioning here perfectly fine, 
then what good is it me dotting around the world? Oh yeah, I like it here. Yeah, it's okay here. I'm just giving myself mental fatigue. I'm just giving myself more shit to think about. I, I just think, it, I think that goes back to that one topic that we all said, it's just like experiences. Because you know, I, I, I still want to know how it is to be in Tokyo. I want to know how it is to be, I don't know, in, in like the Nordic countries, like Norway or something. Just like to, to have, not, not in particular to be like, oh, I might want to move there, but just to like experience the places so you can, you can paint a better picture of the you know what yeah. i mean i i think that's right but i don't think the trade-off of me being horribly inefficient at my work spending a fuck ton of money is worth it okay not currently like again you need to like just shut up and sacrifice for a good few years and set yourself up and then maybe you can start thinking about stuff like that it's like every time i go on a trip like this it like it, it gives me so much fuel and when i come home i'm like i gotta smash some work bro i don't know why it, it just fuels me i don't for some get reason. that i don't get it I, when i go away i always i i have fun i have fun i come back and i feel horrible for like five days because i'm realizing how one, how much work I've just missed out on, and two, how inefficient I am because I'm now readjusting. And it makes me so unhappy. Whenever, literally any time, any time when I'm, when I'm not able to do work, I feel horrible. In my trip to the UK, I did the bare minimal for my business, if that, if that, honestly. I really struggled, really fucking struggled. And then when I, I didn't feel it when I was there. I got back here, wow, man. For like two weeks to a month, I felt horrible. I felt horrible. I was like, Fuck me, like I'm so behind, I have so much shit to do. Um, I, I just did nothing, I did barely did anything productive. There's so many missed opportunities, da da da. Like, I, c I couldn't imagine, it just wouldn't work for me. I'd, I'd hate to just, you know, oh yeah, I fancy a little fucking dilly dally trip over to Vietnam and I'll see what the life's about there. Like, I don't give a fuck, I, I just, I don't, I don't care. Maybe, maybe again, like in, you know, a few years when I'm like set, I have a fucking absolute beast of a business going the machine is well oiled it's going maybe maybe i'll take a guilt-free trip to, to somewhere you know happily and like maybe if like maybe if there's a reason to go there maybe if there's a fucking g posted up there and i can do a podcast with him hell yeah dope you know couple it in with work but in terms of like yeah i just fancy a new environment fancy some new scenery you know like i it's just it does not like resonate with me at all it's like man just you you, you don't deserve it you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it yet. You haven't done the work to, to, to deserve that. And it, I feel that when I come back. It's funny because it, it is exactly that. And I think I said that earlier. I get the exact same feeling when I come back home. But for me, it's not like, a, th th that's not like, a, oh, I come home and then I have to be like sad for two weeks until I can work. It's the exact opposite. When, when I get this feeling, I come home and I'm like, I'm going to work my ass off now. I still so work. I, if I, I want to, I could, for, for example, like for example, that was it. When I come back from London from my first trips, that's literally what I thought. I was like, I'm gonna put in the work, and I'm gonna get like back in the day, I didn't have my own business, so I was like, I'm gonna get a well-paid job in London, and I'm gonna live there. And for that, I need to be good, and that fueled me to get home, and then start working, so I can afford to go there again. So the, this this whole sadness of like not being in that place that was so great no more fuels me and basically tells me, look, if I put in the work now, I can't afford to go there. I just need to bust my ass, but it is possible. I can do it. And that basically, it fuels me. It gives me like this energy of like, I could be in that place again, the sooner, like as soon as I get my shit done. You know what I mean? I suppose the difference is I'm so happy here. I'm so happy here and I'm so fulfilled here. I've got great friends here. I don't even have a reason to go anywhere else. I really don't. Like I suppose like you were inspired by going to London because you felt like you wanted to live in London for some fucking reason. But like I think you can have fun on holiday in London, but like living there is just a fucking different story. Again, like if you go on holiday somewhere, you can't pick up the details that you need to know if it's a good place to live. No, no, but it's, 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 it's like going on a first date. You don't go on a first date and are already prepared to marry that woman. You go on that first date to find out if it even fits. You know what I mean? And that's what a short trip is for. You go there and you just check out, is this even, do I even like this in that short period of time? And if that is a yes, then you can start thinking about, you know, is it clever to live here? Is it a good location? How's the pricing and all this stuff? But like this, this short trip is more of like, give you a, a preview of the, you know, of the city, for example, you know? But like, if I'm already set here and if I'm happy here and if I've got everything I need here, why do I give a fuck? 
I, the problem is I, I would say it's important to see other places. If you ask me why, I could not give you a reason. I, like just for me as a person, I like to have new experiences. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not the world traveler. I don't need to see Russia and Korea and all this stuff, but I, I want to see like, you know, the major, the major cities. Uh, just, I don't know. I, just, I mean, Russia is pretty major, bro. Okay, major European cities. Right, okay. Um, because I, I don't like, I mean, to be fair, that the flight here wasn't that bad, but you know. No, I'm, I'm just saying, um, I want to have at least experienced it once. Can but why don't you just do that after you've built the business and the, oil, the, the machine's well oiled and like everything's flowing? You well, know, why, why do you have to do it now? Because it's just, all it's doing is taking away from your ability to do what you need to do. Because uh, as you may know, my lifestyle is very just work-based. Like some have months where I, I, the only thing, like m to be fair, most of the time, I only work and go gym. That's all I do the whole time. So because I don't really, I don't go golfing or I don't do this with my friends or that and go out in the evening, I, I don't I really- I suppose that makes more sense. So you, you literally work like six to 12 hour days. Yeah. Whereas my life setup is more balanced. Yeah, my, yeah, that's why I mean, mine is not balanced. So if, if I work my ass off for two months and then I have a, a trip with my friends for five days. Yeah, that, that's pretty guilt free. Yeah, be yeah, because I, I, it's like, it's not like, I, that's why I don't come home and think I, I wasted time. But I do, I can feel after like a few days how I'm like, I kind of want to go back to work. I, I get that feeling, but I don't feel like, oh, I've wasted the last few days because I knew it's like, it's refueling me a bit. I'm having a great time. I can experience uh, like a city at the so same time. So you reckon? Time. You reckon if I was to go somewhere, like you know, for a few days, I would just step on the gas pedal for the week prior, work really, really hard, and I'd probably have a much better time. Yeah, and I think that's what I've done most of the times. Like, but whenever I know I'm going somewhere on holiday or some shit, I, I, I always try to get stuff done before, and it's always stressful. Every like, it's always before a holiday and after a holiday where I'm the most stressed. Because before everyone's like, oh, but we need this done before you go. We need this done before you go. And then you're on holiday and it's like, oh, this revision, this, and then this new project is coming in. And then you come home and you're like, you know, you've, you've, got, you've got the whole lot waiting for you basically. So it's like before holidays and after holidays, I always get smashed. So I, I can kind of like, I can chill on holidays because I know I already did the work and I have to do the work anyway when I come back. So it's not like I'm feeling guilty because I'm there. It's like, it's always out of place for me. It's like, I, I never booked a holiday. Like I book them in three months advance and still when the holiday comes, this project is late, revisions here. Oh, can you take this please on holiday just in case they have another revision. It's like, I never have a holiday where I'm completely done before I go and nothing when I come back. It's, it's always like around holidays, it's always very stressful. So for me, this time, off and I still have to do work. I've, I said, I never had a holiday where I didn't have to do at least one revision or some shit. Um, it's, I, I can chill because I know I'm, I'm, the only thing I do is put the work in. That makes more sense. Yanis, why haven't you started a YouTube channel? The funny thing is, because I'm trying to be a very reflective person and I'm trying to be honest to myself, mm -hmm. it is, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the answer myself. Um, I just know I had the same barrier when I, actually when I started the Rust channel that we talked about earlier. For me, it took good recordings where I was like, this is fire material, this is gonna be a sick video, I, I wanna put this out now. And th that just that fueled me and I, was, I made the intros, I made animations for it, templates, and I edited them with memes, and I, was, I, I spent so much time. Um, I know it's not a good trait to have, but for me, motivation is, for certain stuff, a very big motivator. Just for the context for the listeners here, I've been hounding Yanis to start a YouTube channel for a very long time because I feel like with your current business model, Yanis, you're running on a hamster wheel. You're constantly trading your time for money. You don't really have passive income. You've got a few hustles coming in, but like you don't have passive income stream so you're constantly running on a hamster wheel for money time equals money and i'm saying you're one of the most talented motherfuckers i know you could make an, an absolutely incredible youtube channel i've been hounding you to do it for ages and you've not yet done it so you said that you need motivation you need clips you haven't recorded a single video yet you yeah, have um, an entire document yanis has done everything 
but record a YouTube video. You've done everything. You've done like some transitional stingers, which probably took you a while of seeing them, but very good. You've got a massive document full of video ideas. Scripted them? I don't know. A, a few. You've scripted a few. You've done everything but make a YouTube video. Why? Because this is, this is very important for the boys watching this because yeah. my number one advice, I get DMs all the time. Sam, I want to do a YouTube channel. What do I do? Number one, start. Fucking start. You've got to start. You've got to get the ball rolling straight away. As soon as you've got a video out, that's when you can start optimizing. But you have not recorded. You've not sat down. You've not recorded a video. You've bought a tripod recently. And the is, camera. Which is good. We've got the camera and a tripod. But we have not got a Yanis video. Why? For me, I, I can't put anything out that's just half done or just quickly done, you know, to start, to start off, for example. Like, um, what it would take is a video idea where I would be like, that is such a sick concept. It would go 100% with the theme I'm going for for the channel and I can record this right now. And then, then I'd be on fire. The problem is that that's like a variable that shouldn't be like the, the it's like a, a barrier of entry that I set for myself. Um, because I put a lot of effort into everything I do, I knew if I would start with a, any of the videos on the list, there's good ones there, but I, I would love to have one where I'd be like, that, that's it. You know, th that's it. And, and if, if that's just the, the first spark that lights the fire, that's, that's great. But the problem is with this line of thinking, I just set this barrier of entry for an, like an unforeseeable like time frame. But I don't know, maybe I'll never get that idea where I'm like, that's the one. Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's hard to explain because I'm, I'm, I, I actually, I couldn't even tell you exactly what I haven't started yet. And, and this, is, this is a common problem that a lot of people have as well. It's a common problem, everyone thinks. My first video has got to be absolutely fucking incredible. It's got to be the best thing ever. It's got to motivate me. It's got to set my heart on fire. But the most successful people I know, they literally just start. They don't even know what they're doing. I'll give Jack as an example. Yeah, sorry, we just had some technical difficulties there. But uh, as I was saying, Jack, CEO, is a perfect example of exactly this. When I met Jack in Thailand, he was 5,000 pounds in debt. He was trying to launch a fitness business, fitness coaching business. It wasn't necessarily going his way. And he was trying to figure out how was he gonna self-sustain himself in Thailand. When I met him, I immediately knew that he had a personality that belonged in front of a camera. And I said to him, you need to make a YouTube channel. Make a YouTube channel, Jack. You need to, you belong in front of a camera. That exact same night, he went home, uploaded his first video. And the video is not necessarily good, you know, he was just, <laughs> talking in front of a camera, basically introducing himself. But the most important part is he got the ball rolling. He started. And then after that, he continued to upload videos. And a more recent example from actually his vlog that he uploaded last night, uh, he wanted to start, he wanted to have a boxing match. Before figuring out any logistics, he didn't figure out like the opponent, who's gonna train him, where it was gonna happen, when it was gonna happen. He literally just started. He hit up a guy that he knew from a business networking group who had talked about, you know, he trains people uh, for boxing. He messaged him, boom, he's got himself a, a coach. Started training, everything else has fallen into place for him. Within two weeks, he went from having nothing planned to a videographer out in Bangkok recording him for his training camps, an opponent to fight, two coaches, a pay-per-view to get on, and the stadium that he's gonna be fighting in is the biggest stadium in Thailand, Lumpini Stadium, which is insane. Like. Muay Thai legends throw down there. All of that happened within two weeks of him just starting. He didn't figure any of this logistical shit out. He just fucking started. He just started, bro. So Yanis, my question to you. Will you start a fucking YouTube channel tomorrow? Tomorrow, I want you to start work on a video. Will you? I'll start tomorrow. Tomorrow. Boom! Yanis will start a YouTube channel tomorrow, boys. And you're gonna change the fucking game because you're very good at what you do. Anything that you touch is, is fucking gold. So I have no doubt that you're gonna change the game and you can come back to this podcast in a few months time when you've got 100K subs and multiple viral videos. You'll smash it, no problem. You just need to make that first video, bro. That's it, that's the only barrier to entry and you've been trying for a year to just make a, just, just make a video. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to set your heart on fire. You just need to start, bro. All right. Well, I'll set it on camera now. So no going back from here. Good things to come. Looking further into the future, how, how do you see yourself performing or more like what do you see yourself doing in the upcoming 
few years. What I see myself doing in the next few years is, is essentially more of the same. I think I have a very good message. I think young men have a lot of traps to fall into. I think a lot of people who people listen to for advice don't necessarily embody their own message. I think I have unique perspectives to share. I think I have a very unique journey. I think I have an inspiring journey. And I want to share that to more people. So I want to continue to grow my audience. Um, and just doing the lecture inside of the Academy of Excellence yesterday was like really nice because um, Obviously, I'm speaking directly to the people I'm trying to reach in my videos, but I'm speaking one-to-one -one with them and, and hearing like the actual positive, the tangible positive impact I'm having on people's lives, whether that be, because it's a video editing academy, but like in the lecture, you were there. Like there was actually a lot of like just developmental questions as well, because people just want to hear that from me. Yeah. On top of the video edit and stuff. So just hearing like the positive impact I'm having on people's lives in terms of both mindset, lifestyle, and also just generating online income is like really fucking inspiring for me. So I want to continue to do that. I want to continue to grow my audience so that that message can reach more people. Because I think there's still so many young men like me three years ago who couldn't even leave the house to see his friends to go to the fucking cinema. Yeah, for sure. There's still so many men exactly like that and... I think I, I I hope I can I can reach them on, on, on a deep level and tell them like listen there's there's more to life. You can achieve you can emulate similar results to me if you just start making slight adjustments and better decisions over a long time period and that really inspires and motivates me. It makes me very feel very purposeful. I want to continue to do that. I want to reach more people with that. And obviously, of course, I also want to just look after the people close to me as well. I think that motivates all of us. Like we we want to be able to provide and pr provide security to those that we love. So I want to continue to do that as well. That's me for the next few years. Yeah, that sounds great. That also like, um, I know how much it fulfills you to do this stuff. So I, I know that you're on the right path and I can already see like all the people that profit from your knowledge. So um, I really think you're doing a good um, and you're definitely on the right way. Yeah, I mean, you you were there for the lecture yesterday. Like, what, what did you think? Um, I mean, the boys there, like, they're, they're, they're actually a pleasure to speak to. It's like, they're, they're all very calculated. They're all on their shit. I mean, I was, there was a 17-year-old in there yesterday who's making four and a half thousand pounds a month online, which is fucking incredible. And he's thinking, like, you know, should I move out yeah. at 17? Yeah, that's Imagine mean. that's me at 17. Like, yeah. That's incredible. So I really feel like I'm, I'm fast-tracking people's progress through both my videos and also the, the service that I'm selling, which is the Academy of Excellence. It's Definitely. Now, what, what was a really fun experience, the people were really fun to talk to. They had uh, serious questions. You could see that they were literally like stuck in some ways and they were looking for knowledge. Yeah, it's, it's just great. It's great to talk to your, um, to your audience. Um, they're very open. They're very fun. And um, yeah, we yeah, like you to can... have fun. We like to have a bit of fun as yeah. well. You know, that's, that's another thing. Like, People in my space, they take themselves a bit too seriously sometimes, I think. And I think that's a, another unique spin that I can put on things. Like, I'm, I'm still a shit poster at heart. Mm. My old series on YouTube was shit posting compilations of me just playing games. But, like, I feel like I, just injecting a bit of that sort of humor into my videos will help reach more people as well. Because I think that's why Jeffrey and Adonis format took off so much, is because that's speaking directly to the people who need to hear this mm. empowering message. So I think if I can mix in a bit of that, with my message, which is overall a positive message. And it's a it's an empowering message. I think young men are just bombarded constantly with very disempowering messages. And I want to I want to change the narrative on that. But I want to reach the people who really need to hear it with just my shit posting humor. And I think that's very important to me. I think we have to slowly wrap it up. The sun is leaving us. I hope the, you can still light, see us somewhere us. in the shadows. <laughs> We're lurking. The light's leaving us. But that, that was a fucking great talk. And uh, Thank you, Yanis. Yeah, uh, for sure. It was great being here, man. Yanis, uh, again, my, my best friend for the last five years. The most consistently fantastic friend I have. And uh, you've heard it here first. He's starting his YouTube channel. He's going to start his video tomorrow. No. And you guys can follow my journey. Uh, you can put my YouTube channel in the description or whatever. I'll put it up on screen. And uh, you'll see if I actually did record my first video tomorrow. So it's going to be... Yeah. It's gonna be interesting. Be a little bit patient though, this guy likes. Yeah, I, I, like, to, I like to put work. If, if I record it tomorrow, I'll need some time to perfect it, but I'll put it out there. Yeah, so Yanis's stuff will be in the description, guys. Please go and uh, follow him. Again, one of the most talented people I know. And uh, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. And uh, I'll be seeing you boys soon. Take care. Have a good one.